industry, uh, and then switched into journalism and writing, and has written many sort of articles for newspapers and uh, magazines. Uh, he's published two book textbooks on paleontology, and I noticed that he's also dabbled in the comedy detective campus romance field, uh, which must be a captive in market. I don't know how many people have covered that level of uh, things in one subject. Not many. <laughs> um, Ted now edits the monthly news magazine Geoscientist for the Geological Society uh, of um, London. Uh, he's also written a book called Incoming, uh, published in 2011, Incoming or Why We Should Stop Worrying and Learn to Love the Meteorite, and that is probably the most relevant uh, book to today's topic, which is called Incoming, Learning to Love the Dreaded Thunderstone. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Ted. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and, um, and welcome to the Geological Society, um, my uh, place of work. Uh, nice to be home. Um, I'm going to just do a little test to make sure that my graphics are working. Oh, there we are. Um, it will come as no surprise to you that this talk is a, a thinly veiled um, sales exercise uh, for the book, which you see illustrated top left, and which is available for sale at a mere £10 uh, in the, the Society Library, should you, should you wish to pop up there um, after the talk. You may not wish to, of course. It uh, all depends on me. Um, and my next slide, actually, is to, is to thank... <clears throat> is to thank the Royal Astronomical Society for inviting a geologist to talk about meteorites, um, which um, uh, I'll, I'll, have, I'll have something to say about um, on interdisciplinary research a little later. Uh, it, uh, I should also apologize for having to use notes. Um, one of the things they don't tell you about writing books is that the work doesn't stop once it's published, and um, they say, oh, well, you, would you go there and talk about the book and go here and talk about the book? So you have to have a talk. And um, if you write what we uh, rather laughingly call popular science books, uh, you're liable to have two audiences, the general book reading public at a literary festival and then uh, a more scientifically literate um, uh, audience at, this, at a science festival. So now you're into two talks. And then you find that you have to do one at 30 minutes and one at 40 minutes and one at 50 minutes. So you've got six talks. And this is maximally confusing. So uh, just to keep me on track, because I'm a fully paid up member of the Ramblers Association, um, I, 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 have, I have the script to make sure that I'm, I, I, I don't overrun. Right, well, I'm, I'm overrunning already. Um, it came as a shock to me, it may to you, or maybe not, because you know more about astronomy than I do, um, to learn that the Earth is being hit by meteorites at, um, well, estimates vary, but the higher ones say somewhere around 30 to 40,000 tonnes every day. This is called the meteorite flux. So the Earth, uh, who is in her middle age, after all, is getting heavier day by day, familiar sort of problem. But of course, it's a rate that's actually negligible because the mass of the Earth is about 6,000 billion billion tons. So in effect, it doesn't really count for very much. Now, most of that daily flux is minute, and we're not aware of it. Um, dust particles which just drift into the outer atmosphere, but some uh, like the uh, Chelyabinsk meteorite, for example, uh, from February 2013, are big enough to create huge fireballs in the atmosphere uh, and even to make it through the protective shield uh, that it represents uh, to Earth. Some, uh, very few, uh, fortunately, are so large that they can reach the ground with most of their cosmic velocity intact. I always think cosmic velocity is one of those great unused names for a rock group. Uh, maybe, <laughs> may, maybe you'd like to found one. Um, now, co cosmic velocities, we're talking here about speeds, phenomenal speeds, really, um, something like up to 40 kilometers per second. Um, now, here we have Hoba, uh, which is the largest uh, nickel iron mass on the face of the Earth uh, in Namibia with my mother-in-law for scale. Uh, it was moving very fast in space, like everything else. We all know why things move very fast in space. Nothing can stop it. Of course, there's another reason. Space is, space is huge. If things didn't move fast, they'd never get anywhere. Um, but on impact, what happens is all that kinetic energy then immediately flashes to heat, resulting in a vast explosion. There's nothing explosive otherwise about meteorites, but they can cause enormous explosions as this kinetic energy is converted. And with a really big asteroid, you get a release of energy that would dwarf all the world's nuclear arsenals. Um, 
going off at once, many times over. Now, the other thing to bear in mind, um, now I don't, probably don't need to tell you this, but I'll say it anyway, is that space, for all its vastness, it's not very far away. Um, if, your, if your Vauxhall Cavalier could do up, uh, you could get there in about 40 minutes without breaking the speed limit. So it's not very far. We are in that environment, and it can get to us, really, uh, without too much difficulty. Now, in my book, I try to examine two themes in parallel. Uh, one is the effect that um, meteorites have upon uh, the history of life, and have had upon the history of life. Um, we have the now famous impact uh, that everybody surely uh, knows now had a lot to do with the um, disappearance of the non-avian dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Uh, and on the other hand, we have some exciting new research um, which uh, is suggesting that from 480 million years ago, that's a long, that's a long time ago, it's in the middle of Ordovician, the Earth was bombarded by meteorites at such a rate that you can actually find them fossilized in sediments. The old, surely the rarest thing on the face of the Earth, a fossilized meteorite. And we're finding quite a lot of them. And yet then there wasn't a mass extinction, quite the reverse. Um, that was a time of one of the biggest burgeoning um, e events of complex life uh, since the base of the Cambrian. And how can these two things both be true? So that's one thing that I examine. The second, the second theme is the history of ideas about meteorites from the earliest times to the present. Because rather like shooting stars themselves, ideas are flashing through the human mind all the time. Um, that's the sort of ideas flux, if you like, 40,000 tons a day. Um, but only at certain times in history do ideas have uh, an impact. Um, do they have a timeliness, in fact? And there is a timeliness, this is my thesis anyway, there is a timeliness in the arrival of ideas, just as there is in the arrival of meteorites, which uh, lead to consequences at some times and yet not at others. Um, when they might be premature. Underlying both stories, I believe, is, is something that's fundamental, a fundamental fact about the nature of history uh, that also serves to explain why geologists and physicists, um, who are the two scientific tribes, I suppose, who are most deeply involved in the story that I tell, tend to take differing views um, about that most famous extinction of all, the one at the end of the Cretaceous period 65 million years ago. Now, just jumping back to a bit of astronomy for a while, um, nearly all meteorite material comes to us from the asteroid belt, uh, which is the debris field which uh, lies between the orbits of Mars, the outermost rocky planet, and Jupiter, the biggest of the gas giants. There are many, many different types of meteorites, but the essential thing to know about them is that they are all very old. In fact, they are the oldest things uh, that it is possible to hold in your hand. And... Uh, and here is one. This is the Middlesbrough meteorite. It's very old. It uh, dates from 1881. Um, <laughs> now, um, the, the, I say they're the oldest things because um, what meteorites are is that they're stray um, pieces of, ast of, of, the made, of, of, of the stuff out of which the planets were made. Um, as that swirling disk of dust and gas that surrounded the early sun coalesced into bigger and bigger orbiting bodies, creating the solar system. Now, when did this happen? Well, if you perform a radiometric dating exercise on meteorites, you will obtain the oldest known date, uh, the date which is taken as the origin of the planets, uh, and therefore the maximum age of the Earth, which is very easy to remember, at least it was, before some idiot did some more research and spoiled it. Um, but at least when I wrote the book, it was 4567, 4,567 million years ago. So, um, to begin, um, I'd like to take you back in time uh, to an era quite different from our own when almost nothing we now know and take for granted existed and which now seems unimaginably alien and just plain weird. Uh, and I mean, of course, the 1970s. <laughs> uh, this was a very, very different world. Um, for example, at that time in Britain, um, at least in my part of Britain, uh, it wasn't normal for students or indeed very many other people, to shower more than once, time, well, once a week. And those who did caused comments, which is why I remember it. Nor had anybody, unless they'd visited the US, ever seen a McDonald's. 
Uh, the very first one opened for burgers and fries in 1974 on Powys Street in, in Woolwich. Uh, and for the first time, the British people uh, saw a really clean restaurant, <laughs> and they mistook it for glamour. It was that strange. <coughs> but surely no more remarkable than this um, is the fact that at that time, paleontologists, that's my tribe, uh, were reluctant to talk about mass extinctions. They didn't like them at all. I mean, today, by contrast, it's, <coughs> it's difficult to get paleontologists to talk about much else. Um, the reason for this reluctance was that they were following Charles Lyell. Now, Charles Lyell, um, they'd grown used to this I I idea that um, uh, sudden things just don't happen. Um, and if they do, they don't have any lasting effects. Uh, and so they'd got used to rationalizing apparently sudden things out of existence. Perhaps mass extinctions only appeared to be sudden because of perhaps slower deposition. Why deposition was slower, of course, was another matter, but that would, that would produce the result. Uh, perhaps they were brief quickenings of everyday processes, uh, standard stuff just happening more quickly. Or perhaps even they were artificial. And there is some truth in this. Um, paleontologists do tend to work on rocks of a certain age. And um, so the idea was that if they don't stray into other areas, certain groups of paleontologists will work on this lot of uh, rocks, and then this lot of rocks gets worked on by somebody else, and they change all the species. So maybe uh, there is some truth in that, actually. Um, but is it enough to explain mass extinctions? Well, well, no. But there was another theory. Perhaps extinctions are self-imposed disciplinary boundaries. And the way that my old professor, Derek Ager, um, wrote of mass extinctions, he wrote, um, there is no point in denying them, um, shows that at that time that's what most paleontologists were, were doing. Now, I was, I was lucky in my teacher because Derek Ager was the geologist who did most to uh, rehabilitate the rare event into uniformitarianism. That was his main lasting contribution to um, the way we all think about Earth history today. But even so, he hardly ever mentioned meteorite strikes. Um, because ideas like that back in the 1970s took a, very, uh, took a scientist very, very close to the edge of the lunatic fringe. Um, comets, meteorites, supernovae, clouds of cosmic dust, they were all highly distasteful um, as geological agents. Um, they were the mainstay of the pseudo-scientific fringe. Um, the, out, the, the, the outpourings of this fringe were, were particularly um, massive during the 1970s, and the shells were groaning almost as loudly as the geologists who occasionally read the books. Um, you may remember Eric von Daniken, for example, uh, <coughs> who explained history by invoking aliens uh, in Chariots of the Gods in 1968 and um, subsequent volumes. Uh, not to mention, of course, the granddaddy of them all, Emmanuel Velikovsky. Uh, now, his books were written much earlier, but they took on a new lease of life um, in the 1970s. And if the risk of being compared with these nutcases was not enough um, to <laughs> discourage uh, legitimate scientists from considering cosmic influences, there was yet another factor which um, affected them, and that was the parsimonious instinct of the true scientist. Um, you'll be familiar with one of science's central assumptions, uh, which rarely leads a physicist astray, um, and that's Occam's razor, the idea that the simplest explanation for any observed phenomenon is probably right. Um, the perfect example being the Copernican versus the Ptolemaic systems, for example. Um, the system that doesn't involve all those epicycles is the one that's probably right. And at that time, that notion, that maxim, was taken uh, by geologists, at least, to mean uh, that looking outside the Earth for explanations of things wasn't proper, because that was invoking a deus ex machina. Um, and even worse than that, possibly, it was straying into another fellow's discipline. <laughs> um, now, in those days, this was another big change, in the 1970s, boundaries between subjects, as enshrined in the Geological Society and the Astronomical Society and the Linnaean Society and so on, these Victorian discipline boundaries were, they now seem arbitrary, but then they were like iron curtains um, ordained by God. But although um, Derek remained very chary of meteorites. There were others who were younger and had less credibility at risk, uh, who, uh, who were not so reluctant. Um, Eger had the effect of drawing towards him um, students who were eager to work in this new field, uh, which rapidly became known as neo-catastrophism. 
And I, I well remember a sort of frisson of delight, um, forbidden delight, uh, passing through the lecture theatre at, the, uh, at the university one evening when, when one of these students, the late Richard Hodgkinson, who um, had previously worked at NASA, so he, you know, he came to us sprinkled with a certain amount of stardust, uh, and he delivered a seminar um, about the hunt for overlooked impact craters on Earth. Um, even admitting the existence in any number of impact craters on Earth was then regarded as a complete heresy. And yet, that was in the very late 70s, barely five years later, um, I found myself listening to much wilder ideas um, without anybody turning a hair. Uh, including one that suggested that extinctions happened every 26 million years on a regular kind of clockwork basis, um, caused by cometary objects being catapulted out of their peaceful existence in the Uruk cloud um, and um, catapulted into uh, the inner solar system by a mysterious companion star as yet unidentified uh, to the sun, which was dubbed Nemesis. Now... What had happened in between was that Derek Ager's neo-catastrophist revolution had triumphed. The context, in other words, had changed. Uh, science was ready for these sorts of ideas. And in fact, in 1980, catastrophism really, really came home to roost with a, with a vengeance. Now, not very far from uh, Siena, which by one of those cosmic coincidences is the uh, Tuscan city where, for the very first time in history in 1794, Meteorites rained out of the sky on professors instead of on peasants. Um, and that was what forced uh, the scientific establishment then to take seriously the idea um, that, that stones could drop out of the sky. Anyway, not very far away is this place, the Bottaccioni Gorge, um, where rocks are found which span the end of the Cretaceous period and the early Paleocene uh, in a very long cutting up a, a road section. And at 347.6 metres in this measured section lay what we all now know as the, the KT boundary, um, a band of clay. Uh, it's about two centimetres thick. And the geologists um, uh, Walter Alvarez and Terry Engelder um, took the crucial sample of this clay in 1977. Now, you'll see from, from that picture that the clay partings between the limestones are, are, are common. Uh, but this one is thicker than all the others. That's the one that's just above uh, Walter Alvarez's hand there. So it's this, this one here. Um, now, this wasn't just any old clay parting. Um, it, it, it was marking the boundary, not only between two geological periods, but between the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic eras. So that's when fossils of, the, of middle life um, give way to those of recent life. So... You have a, uh, the Mesozoic world, which is full of dinosaurs and ammonites and things like that, um, and g giving way to the world full of hippopotamuses and aardvarks and us. Um, now, the question was, and this was the question that Walter wanted to answer, was how long did it take for that clay to be laid down? And this was crucial because slow, slow deposition would mean a slow mass extinction, or could mean that, and its suddenness only apparent. Charles Lyell would approve. But if the reverse were true and normal sedimentation rates applied all the way through, then that means the extinction event would be genuinely fast. And this was the problem that Walt was trying to, trying to solve. Just a short digression. There's a, there's a, the, what sort of fast are we talking about? Because there are all kinds of different ty types of fast. There's geologically fast, which means less than a million years. Uh, there's archaeologically fast, which means less than a thousand years, or there's human life fast, which is last Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> now, to, what Walter wanted to find out was which of these, which ballpark was he in? And what he needed was a really accurate measure of depositional rate. Um, and that was what brought him in, back into contact with his um, illustrious father, who's on the left in the picture, um, who happened to be a Nobel Prize winning nuclear physicist, uh, Luis Alvarez. Uh, of course, we all ask our dads how to do something if we, <laughs> if we, if we, if we don't know. He had that advantage. Now, Luis Alvarez um, knew that he needed uh, something that accumulated always and everywhere on Earth at the same rate every day. The meteorite flux, in other words. And he hit on the idea of using 
one of the elements that's more common in space than it is on the surface of the Earth. Now, he, there were, he had a few false starts, but iri iridium turned out to be um, the one that, uh, that worked. Iridium is rare on the surface of the Earth, but it's abundant in space, um, and it's raining down on us all the time at a pretty constant rate. Of course, the reason it's, it's rare on Earth is that it's, it's one of those elements which cleaves naturally to, to iron and to nickel. And so most of the stuff which came on, uh, which accreted with the Earth, is now down in the core because it's one of those siderophile elements. Um, and the great washing machine of plate tectonics has gradually purged all these elements, or most of them, out of the crust. So it's extremely rare on our differentiated crust, but in undifferentiated material like meteorite material, it's um, still at the cosmic abundance. Now, if the clay recorded a slowdown in deposition, it would tend to show elevated iridium, of course, whereas normal sedimentation rate would produce normal concentrations. Well, what Frank Azaro, who's a geochemist, found when he performed the analysis on the clay astonished him. Um, he found three parts of iridium per billion. Doesn't sound like very much, <clears throat> but that's not just high. It was enormous, I mean, astronomical, in fact, in that sense. So, re doubting, like a good scientist, doubting his results, he redid the experiment and found that he had, in fact, made a mistake. The correct figure turned out to be not three parts, but nine parts per billion, which was 90 times higher than the highest expectation that he'd been given by, by Luis. And what he discovered, of course, was the iridium anomaly, uh, and, and the answer to a question that nobody had been asking. Well, over the summer of 1979, uh, Luis Alvarez, who'd, who'd previously worked on the Manhattan Project with Robert Oppenheimer and Edward Teller, and had actually flown on the mission that um, dropped the, uh, the uranium weapon on, um, on Hiroshima, uh, he began to develop ideas about how a truly gigantic impact might have created um, a worldwide iridium anomaly, suddenly delivering a huge amount of iridium-rich material to Earth, killing the ammonites in the ocean and the dinosaurs on the floodplain and all the other things that also perished at the end of the Cretaceous, but not the things that didn't. Now, uh, what you might call the full Alvarez theory um, holds that this one impact would be enough um, to, uh, to do everything, uh, so a single cause. Um, now, because Lewis was a physicist, of course, he wasn't looking for an answer to a just-so story. He wanted to establish um, a, a, an all-embracing theory. And so he thought, well, maybe, um, uh, maybe impacts like this could be uh, the cause of all mass extinctions. Huh. Well, um, that's a big idea, and as um, Steve Gould uh, once wisely said, nearly all hot ideas eventually turn out to be at least partly wrong. Um, and what happened since 1980, when the original iridium anomaly was discovered, um, was three decades of intensive research uh, where everyone's gone out and looked at the other mass extinction horizons and looked for evidence of extraterrestrial impacts. And I, we can now say quite categorically that no other mass extinction in history has ever had any extraterrestrial connection at all. However, we do know that all of them coincide with the eruption of large igneous provinces. Now, these are vast eruptions for which there is no contemporary um, analog on Earth, fortunately. Um, and this was a fact that was first revealed by Professor Vincent Courtillot, who's the guy with the mischievous look there from the Institut de Physique du Globe in Paris. And he and many other geologists, including most notably um, Professor Goethe Keller of Princeton, have been working on dating the Deccan Traps of India, which are the large igneous province eruption, the remains of it, uh, which coincide with the uh, end Cretaceous extinctions. And they've been trying to get more accuracy on dating these things, because it's very difficult to date volcanic rocks with this amount of accuracy. Radiometric dating doesn't work. And so you have to look at the sediments in between and see if you can find some fossils um, to give you really accurate dating. Um, and of course, most of those fossils, most of those sediments are terrestrial, so there's not very many fossils in them. So it's extremely difficult um, to find anything, any sort of fossil indicator. But this work, which was actually published uh, just before Christmas last year uh, in Science, has now proved quite conclusively that the eruptions first of all, do indeed reach and straddle the uh, end Cretaceous. 
uh, the KT boundary, and that the main phase of eruption began a quarter of a million years before the KT boundary, and that, uh, I'll say this slowly, 1.1 million cubic kilometers, 1.1 cubic kilometers of lava were erupted over the next three quarters of a million years. So that was happening right at the, at the boundary. And in fact, um, a recent, well, fairly recent, uh, 2013 uh, International Conference in London, the biggest ever convened to examine mass extinction causal mechanisms, came overwhelmingly to the conclusion, um, this is now published, um, you can examine this, um, came overwhelmingly to the conclusion that the principal cause, the principal cause of all such extinctions was these large igneous province eruptions, but always combined with a variety of other contributing factors, major and minor, which brings me back to good old Derek Ager. Um, now, several years before the Alvarez theory broke uh, in 1980, Derek wrote um, that he thought every mass extinction would almost certainly prove to have been due to a combination of factors. Um, each factor may have its own global cyclicity, which he represented in what he called his silly diagram, which is a graph with no axes and no values. Um, but um, most of the time, these would be completely out of phase and would cancel one another out, he thought. But that now and then, statistically, it was bound to happen, they would, all cons they would coincide. And that, he thought, was when you would get a mass extinction, where all these things that were happening all the time suddenly coincided to mount one concerted attack upon the edifice of life. And so, using this as our, uh, the basis for our explanation, at the end of the Cretaceous, one of those causes coming on top of the massive volcanism of the Deccan Traps with all its toxic gas and acid rain and a variety of others which were prevalent at the time, a very short coastline. Um, most things that live on Earth live um, in shallow water around the coasts. Now, at that time, the supercontinent uh, of Pangaea was, at its, was more or less at its state of maximum packing, which means that all the, so all, all, all the continents of the Earth were uh, more or less together in a bilobed arrangement stretching from the north to the South Pole, which meant that there was a much shorter coastline than there is now, for example, when we're in a period about halfway through a supercontinent cycle. Life, in other words, was on its knees already, um, and the impact um, played its part by, as it were, putting the tin hat on it and sealing everyone's fate. Okay, so much for the end Cretaceous. Now, to tell the story of, the, uh, of how the meteorite impacts of uh, the mid ordovician 470 to 80 million years ago were discovered, we've got to travel back even farther in time than the 1970s. We're going back to the 1950s. Um, in 1952, a Swedish geologist by the name of Per Thorslund at the University of Uppsala uh, received this. It was a polished slab of limestone, uh, about 65 centimetres square, came from a place called Brunflo in central Sweden. And it was unusual because, as well as the usual fossils, um, uh, rather nice orthocone nautiloid there, of which there's a large number in this deposit, uh, it's much used as ornamental stone for floors and that sort of thing. Uh, but as well as that, this, this particular rock uh, contained a large black mass, uh, 10 centimeters across. Well, what was it? Um, the limestone in which it was embedded had formed in a very shallow sea, uh, maybe 100 meters deep. Um, the water was clear. Um, it was free from terrigenous debris, apart from wind-blown dust, which is what the red stuff is. It's what's known as a condensed deposit, so it formed very, very slowly. Um, and the limestones accumulated as shelly organisms died, and they just trickled out and landed on a seamount, receiving nothing else but their skeletons and the dust. Uh, so in that kind of environment, finding a 10-centimeter diameter boulder uh, no matter what composition it had, um, is very difficult to explain. Many kilometers from any ancient shoreline, um, no one could explain it. Uh, there were various theories about rafting. Um, people thought of drop stones, which drop out of, uh, of um, uh, icebergs as they melt. Uh, you, that, that can put a boulder into very fine sediment, but this was tropical at the time, so that didn't seem to work. People thought about you know, uh, methane-supported rafts of decaying seaweed, and, uh, but nothing worked. So um, they did what all scientists do. 
they hid it. Uh, they took it down to the basement, um, <laughs> turned it against the wall and covered it in a cloth. And because um, it was just too embarrassing. And that's where it was. It stayed there for the next 25 years. Now, when you get an, uh, a sort of impasse like that, what's needed is a, is a conceptual leap. And this came um, in the 1970s as more and more geologists, many of them Derek Ager students, of course, were successfully tracking down these previously unrecognized impact craters. And about 200 kilometers uh, south of Brunflo, there lies this uh, circular geological structure called the Silian Ring. I've actually shown you a picture of it already. Um, now, this news, um, it was just being recognized for what it was as an impact structure, very deeply eroded but, and very ancient. But this news streaked through Per Toslan's mind just as he was rearranging his working collection in December 1979. And he re-examined the object, as he wrote, with the idea that it might be a meteorite. Uh, and sure enough, believing something to be possible makes all kinds of things newly visible. And uh, the mysterious black boulder, of course, turned out to be a meteorite, because if you look at it, I mean, it's not a very good picture, but the middle of it looks a bit like a haggis. Um, I mean, this is a proper fossil. Everything's been replaced, but the structures have been preserved. And this is the chondritic, you're seeing a chondritic structure on the inside, and here is the fusion crust around the outside, in, what, in some cases, uh, spalling off even, as, 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 as indeed it does. Um, of course, it was a meteorite, and it was the first fossil meteorite ever to be found. Now, it might have remained an isolated curiosity, but in 1988, in slightly older limestones, another one turned up. Um, but that's getting a bit ahead of our stories. We need to go back to the 1970s. Between 1970 and 1979, at about the time that Torsland was, was re-evaluating this slab, I was, I was beginning my doctoral research in Sweden. In fact, I briefly met uh, Per Torsland. I did a sort of... Uh, I took a holiday from field work and, and went round the universities. There aren't very many, um, so it didn't take too long. Uh, I met him on a tour, and that, the year that I finished my PhD, a Swedish student called Berger Schmitz, um, now, now a professor, um, embarked on his own PhD at Lund, um, where he is now professor. And um, Schmitz had read the newly published Alvarez paper. Um, I ought to mention everybody. It's um, as well as the Alvarez, there was Helen Michael and Frank Azaro. They always get forgotten. Um, but they did the work, actually. <laughs> um, and he saw that this was the biggest scientific game in town, and he went to his. Um, rather stuffy supervisors and said, I'm ditching my PhD research, I'm going to work on this. Uh, which caused a bit of a flurry. But anyway, he did, and he published on the, on the, uh, the theory, and uh, he, uh, the, two of, the two men met. He met Luis Alvarez. Um, uh, interesting story about that, I don't have time to tell it. Uh, but uh, what Luis did was invite him to do his postdoc in um, Berkeley, spelt Berkeley, um, at the end of which... Um, uh, period, Schmitz then went back to Sweden, uh, mentally prepared uh, for what was to come next, because after hearing about the sec second fossil meteorite find, uh, he, uh, what he did was begin a systematic sampling campaign. Um, and since 1993, when I, when I interviewed him for my book, um, he had found um, 90 fossilized meteorites in the rocks of that age. They're all the same type. Uh, they're all L-chondrites. Uh, incidentally, also this type. So this is an L-chondrite as well, the Middlesbrough meteorite. Um, and they all... Um, uh, well, I mean, it's not surprising because L-chondrites are the most common form of meteorite falling even today. Now, 90 sounds a lot of fossil meteorites, but you know, what, is a, what is a lot of meteorites? We know what the Earth's meteorite flux is today, and the normal background rate. Now, if, taking that as a starting point, Schmitz did some, some fairly simple calculations. He had his quarries. He knew how many meteorites he'd found. He knew how big the quarries were. He knew how long the, um, the rocks that he was examining took to be, uh, to, 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 to be laid down. And he calculated that three million years after the bombardment actually began, that's 468 million years ago, the meteorite flux of the Earth rose several hundred times and remained ten times greater than it is today for a further million years. Uh, at its peak, um, the flux reached at least 100 or, uh, to 150 times present-day values. So at this period, the Earth was bombarded for several millions of years by meteorites ranging in size from the very minute to possibly the um, end Cretaceous type enormous, you know, 10 kilometers uh, across. It could be. Uh, that 10 million year period in the middle Ordovician covers the estimated ages 
of no less than four impact craters in Scandinavia alone. That's Lochner, Kardler, Tveren, and Granby. Now, if you work backwards from the meteorite abundances, Schmitz estimated that the size of the original parent body from which this bombardment came, the asteroid which was destroyed in whatever collision had caused all this stuff to arrive with us, was at least 100 to 150 kilometers across, which is a pretty big asteroid. After the collision, the exploded fragments would have given rise to an asteroid family. Uh, this is what happens usually when there's a really big collision. Things fly apart. Some of it gets catapulted out of the asteroid belt completely. Uh, and the gravitational effects sometimes uh, are not great enough to bring everything back together again. So you end up with uh, a family of meteorites, uh, which are the exploded remains, which have gone a certain distance from each other and then remained there, held in a, in a sort of loose cloud, like a flock of geese. Uh, now, there are several such families. Astronomers have known them for a long time. But in 2009, uh, 2009, we even found out which asteroid family uh, was the remains of the, um, of the exploded asteroid, which gave rise to the El Chondrites. Um, and we know this because the light that reflects off these asteroids, and there isn't very much of it because they're all black, um, but the, um, uh, when, when you measure the spectrum of the light that comes back off these asteroids and compare it with the spectrum you get from reflected light from a slice of meteorite on a, on a microscope stage, they match precisely. Uh, and the Geffian family uh, is the name of it. The Geffian family's age had already been estimated by astronomers at 485 million years. Um, and the diameter of the pa family's parent body, which was obtained uh, by astronomers by putting everything that's there back together, they thought, um, well, about 100 to 150 kilometers across. So everything matched up. Now, so much for the astronomical side of that story. What effect did this bombardment have on life in the Middle Ordovician? Well, um, surprisingly, perhaps, the bombardment coincided precisely with the greatest burst in biodiversity in the entire geological record. Uh, it's known as the Great Ordovician Biodiversity Event. And this had been uncovered by um, the guy, he's the one with the glasses, uh, Jack Sapkowski, who, was the, who entered for the first time time range data for fossil species into a computer database. He was the first guy to do that. And he used this then to draw graphs like this one of uh, how global bi biodiversity has gone up and down in time. And as expected, this picks up the, the big five extinctions um, indicated by the, by the red arrows there. There's the big five. Um, but it also revealed uh, this. <laughs> Uh, which is this big rise in biodiversity, the biggest there is, and certainly the biggest that is not a rebound from a previous mass extinction. Now, if we close in for more detail, this is what it looks like translated into the time scale of the middle Ordovician. Uh, this is Berger Schmidt's own diagram. Uh, now, here we can see there's a very precise correlation between the arrival of the first meteorites, um, it's there, the arrival of the first meteorites, uh, and the jump in speciation, um, and also of the extinction of other species. So you have um, the red line shows you extinction rates, and the black line shows you new species. Now we go. Now, um, the question now arises is how could and why did, if you accept the how, uh, this bombardment give rise to increasing biodiversity, whereas the end Cretaceous impact, or impacts, uh, helps to make a mass extinction. And this is why it's time to meet Estonian astronomer and astrophysicist Ernst Julius Erpik. Now, you will all, if you don't know him, you'll know Lembit, um, <laughs> former Liberal Democrat MP for Montgomeryshire who in fact played, of course, played a major role in establishing the uh, UK arm of the International Project Space Guard, which searches for asteroids that might, might hit us. Now, Ernst's um, speciality, it's kind of the family business, um, were the asteroids and comets, the minor bodies. And as long ago as, as the 1950s, he saw that impacts might have affected life in the past. But his idea was not about global catastrophe. He was looking to extend the nuclear arms um, analogy a bit. He was looking for limited theater of, um, uh, impacts, things that caused localized damage. Because if an impact were to devastate uh, a smallish area, it could, 
for example, kill off an entire species that's endemic to that area. So if the object landed in Australia, um, you might exterminate the kangaroo, but you wouldn't exterminate all the marsupials because they've got, they, they, they've got a much wider distribution. A lot of animal and plant distribution on Earth is provincial in that way. And for these organisms, extinction by impact might not demand a global catastrophe. Now, Erpik's limited theatre impacts wouldn't have been responsible for mass extinctions, but they, what, what they would do is sterilise large areas and so leave them open to fresh colonisation. They would, in effect, loosen the stranglehold that endemic species had on that area and thus denied a foothold to other species. And once their grip was removed, these opportunistic new species, hitherto denied access, could enter and thrive, increasing, increasing global biodiversity, translating through time into evolutionary diversification. Now, this is a phenomenon which is well known to ecologists. It's called intermediate disturbance theory. And it's a phenomenon that I saw myself operating when I did my PhD research on the biodiversity increase which you see in Silurian age um, fossil reefs on the Swedish island of Gotland. Um, what happened there was I was, I was looking at deep water reefs of low, di low biodiversity and as soon as they got smashed up by wave base in a shallowing environment, uh, the physical destruction of the environment created new habitats which allowed new species to come in and colonize them, increasing biodiversity. Uh, you see it when quarrying uh, creates cliff habitats in places that didn't have cliffs before. Uh, butterfly species are much more common in, um, much more numerous uh, in um, coppiced woodland, for example, than uncoppiced. Uh, you see it everywhere. Physical disturbance, as long as it's not too severe, obviously, stimulates biodiversity by increasing physical diversity of your habitat. So although statistically, at least one of the many impacts during um, those 10 million years of the mid ordovician could have been chicxulub sized the effect, of the, the effect that they had on the thriving ecosystem of the balmy mid-Ordovician was quite different. The mid-Ordovician was a very different world. Um, there was no large igneous province being erupted. It was not a poisoned, anoxic, acid rain spattered hothouse world like the late Cretaceous. The same agency in a different context produces a different result. Now, I began thinking about this talk in its first, in its first sort of uh, incarnation uh, on November the 11th. It was uh, one of those coincidences, Armistice Day. And um, we might remember Gavrilo Princip squeezing the trigger on the 28th of June 1914 and sparking the Great War um, and analyze what that chain of events. The bullets emerged from Princip's gun. Uh, with a very, very high level of certainty. It's simple. It trigger, cap, explosion, physics. Uh, simple system. Now, the effect of those bullets on the bodies of uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and Sophie, his wife, on that, on that day, was likely, um, though not certain. Um, people do survive gunshot wounds. Um, Princip might have missed. Um, the chauffeur might have taken one for his boss. I mean, who knows? All kinds of things could have happened, but a fairly high level of certainty that he was going to be successful. But that the death of those two people would then drag the world into a great war, kill 20 million people, uh, and bring extinction to the old European order, that was very uncertain. Uh, because now what we're speaking about is the effects of a single event upon a complex system, uh, human society. And in that situation, the outcome of any particular act depends not so much upon the act itself, but upon the context in which it happens. That's history. Now, geologists may be writing the story of the Earth, um, but the science of geology remains that. It remains its history. It's a tale of how a complex system unfolds through time, steered by uh, chance events that are themselves not inevitable, just because they turn out subsequently to be significant. Uh, working out cause and effect in geological history is very hard to do, and the further back you go, of course, the less comparable our present world is uh, with what we're looking at. And life today is not as it was 50 million years ago, let alone 300, 400, or 500 million years ago. A meteorite impact today 
uh, need not therefore produce the same effect on this changed planet uh, as it did uh, back in the, in the late Cretaceous with its different biosphere. So while in physics um, the simpler an explanation is, the more likely it is to be correct. In history, it's all rather different. In history, the simpler your explanation is, the more likely it is to be incorrect. History, you see, is allowed to be complicated. Um, the historian H.A.L. Fisher wrote in his History of Europe, um, hang on, let's get my bifocals in the right position. Men wiser than I, wiser than I, have discerned in history a plot, a rhythm, a predetermined pattern. Those harmonies are concealed from me. I can only see emergency following upon another as wave follows upon wave. In other words, the only basic law in history is shit happens. That's it. You know, um, the consequences of meteorite falls and of ideas about them, just like the consequences of the shooting in Sarajevo, uh, are created largely and possibly entirely by the context in which they occur. And that applies to the Earth as well as to human society because both share that characteristic of being complex, evolving systems. Uh, Shakespeare wrote in Cymbeline, fear no more the lightning flash nor the dreaded thunderstone. And I suppose that's the message I'd like to leave you with. Uh, meteorites are a force of nature in themselves. They're neither good nor evil. Uh, they may have helped bring life to our planet in the first place. I go into that in the book in some detail. They helped to put the dinosaurs out of the way, um, gave us mammals a chance. Though I, you know, I think that dinosaurs would probably have had their day anyway. Uh, they may even have given life that, that essential kick in the genes when it most needed it in the middle Ordovician and helped to fill the world with more complex life um, and lead to things that happened later on. And our wise attempts since 1980 to, uh, to map those near-Earth objects in Project Space Guard has done us a great service already. Uh, because what it's done, now that we know a lot more about what's out there, it has reduced the estimated risk of death by meteorite to something on the same level as death by firework, um, which is about one in 720,000, which is huge. Uh, we accept much greater risks than that every day crossing the road and getting in our cars. Uh, we're all happy to live with, with risks that are a lot greater than that. And don't forget, in all of reliably recorded history, Chelyabinsk notwithstanding, nobody has ever been killed by a meteorite. You will hear stories about dogs and Nakla and all these things. It's, I'm talking about reliably recorded history here. There are explanations for all those others. Uh, of course, we should not stop watching the skies. Um, but if we do one day see one coming, there are at least plausible science fiction scenarios that could enable us to deflect one in time. Um, I'm a great believer in worrying fruitfully about things um, and not fretting bootlessly. Um, and if we want to wish to worry fruitfully about um, the main thing threatening our existence on this rather convenient planet, we don't really need to search for it in outer space um, because it's sitting next to you. Uh, it's, it's us. Oh, ah, final promotion. My new book, out in paperback in May. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for some questions. And as this is being recorded, you're going to have to wait until you have a microphone shoved under your nose. So we'll start over here. Uh, thanks, very interesting. Uh, are there any other iridium anomalies comparable to the KT boundary, or is it unique? Uh, it's unique. Uh, nothing like as big. Uh, as I say, people have been looking for them. Um, and there's another complicating factor with iridium, and that is that it is actually produced in large igneous province eruptions as well, um, because that's one of the things that large igneous province eruptions do. They, it, 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 they drag up a lot of stuff from deeper down in the planet, and so it's quite possible that... Um, that the Earth can produce its own iridium anomalies. Um, the big question has been, of course, to do with the eruption rate and of dating these uh, large igneous provinces with, with sufficient accuracy. Um, they tend to be, in geological terms, fairly short-lived, but the volume that they produce is enormous. Um, now, 
they, they do lead to, to, um, to higher iridium levels, but spread over, 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 over larger thicknesses. But so far, nobody has come up with another iridium anomaly that's anything like the one at the end of the Cretaceous now. I mean, other, other, other things have been looked for. Um, uh, people, people have found, or thought they've found, um, evidence of uh, other, other impact evidence apart from iridium. Um, Buckminster, Buckminster fullerenes, for example, have been, have, have been uh, were thought to have been detected, I think, at the, in, the, in the end Permian extinction, but that, that, um, that I think, was, was fairly swiftly exploded to be a, it was an experimental error. The um, extinctions, which affected animals, mm. what did it do to plant life? Uh, well, the, the, the land plant life, um, the, uh, the, the extinctions um, which we talk about are, are normally documented from, from animal life because animals fossilize so much more easily than, than, than plants do. Um, plants suffer from this, um, from this problem of, of being supremely important in the, in the, in the biosphere, but, but existing in places, at least the land plants, where, where they are usually not, not, not easily fossilized. There are certain, because as we know, certain times, certain places where you can get large amounts of plant life fossilized and the carbon sequestrated in coal and so on, um, and other, other, other forms of, uh, uh, of, of, of buried vegetable matter. Um, the, 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 the plant life of the Mesozoic was radically different from the plant life of the, of the Cenozoic, um, but it, it's um, and you can tell that, but but it, you you can't see the you can't usually see the boundaries using plants because the record is just too patchy. So um, plants are not not a great deal of use in pinning down where mass extinctions occur because the fossil record is too patchy. Thanks very much for that talk. Um, Two related questions, I suppose. One is to do with crocodiles. <laughs> um, no, how come that crocodiles <laughs> pay no attention to all this and just go staggering on yeah. while all around are falling flat? The other thing is um, these uh, igneous eruptions seem to have sort mm. of stopped. Um, mm. Have they? Um, oh. Or are people worried about that? Is that something people should start worrying about? Uh, well, can I take those in reverse order? Um, I mean, large, large igneous provinces, um, no, they haven't stopped. Um, I think we can be fairly confident that there will be another. In fact, probably just about as many as there have been in the past will occur again in the future in the second, um, roughly the second half of the, of the Earth's existence. Um, they seem to be something which is part of the uniformitarianism of the Earth. They, are, they, they happen all the time, but the trouble is that we haven't been here long enough to see one yet. Um, because that's, that's the thing about uniformitarianism, and but that was the chief problem with it, uh, that our sample is too small. Uh, and we vote we, that the rehabilitation of the rare event, large igneous provinces being one of them, um, really involved the realization that what we think of as the normal processes of the Earth because we happen to be uh, have, happen to be around to see them, um, are is just a vanishingly small sample, and the Earth is capable of all kinds of stuff, for which there is no current um, analog. So yes, they will happen again. One will happen again, and um, with any luck, we'll have already we will already be extinct by then. And uh, the um, your first question um, perceptively asks about the crocodile. Um, Yes, the crocodile anomaly is a, is, is a problem. Um, I mean, people, there, there are all kinds of exceptions. Uh, some things just sail through the KT boundary. Um, crocodiles, uh, well, they kind of live with, you know, they live in water. Um, they live off carrion. They don't have to eat very often. Uh, and maybe they were just better suited to um, the miserable existence that there must have been on Earth um, for a long time after the impact. Um, you can you can make up a tale about why the crocodile survived. Some of the others uh, are, are are more difficult than the crocodile, um, and of course we shouldn't forget that it's actually only the non-avian dinosaurs that that that, um, uh, that sail through. We we still have the other dinosaurs on in in the trees all around us. So.
Uh, there was a, a recent report that vast quantities of water had been discovered in some form uh, buried deep in the earth, mm. I've, I can't, 50 kilometers, 150 kilometers down. Yes, I saw those reports, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Enough to account for all the rivers on earth, mm. apparently. What's yeah. it, do you believe that? What's it, what's it doing down there? <laughs> how, how did it get there? Because that doesn't fit with the, uh, no. uh, the formation of the earth from a great big molten mass of No, it doesn't, rock. I mean, the, the, um, it was the the, the whole, the whole um, issue of where all, the, where all the water comes from on Earth, not just the stuff that's all, all the way down there, mm. but the stuff that's on the surface, there is so much of it. Where, why is it there? Why wasn't it driven off? Um, because you know, we're, we're a long way from the snow line, um, as it were, in the, in, in, in the solar system. It should have been too hot. Um, the, as, as I understand it, the explanation for the arrival of, of, of all this water is that it came from cometary bodies, that it was subsequently delivered. Um, so, it was com it, so, so the, the, after, after the initial formation of the Earth, it was the late heavy bombardment that, that brought the water to the surface, and presumably also that water. Um, although, I, as I say, I saw the reports, I didn't read the papers, so, um, I mean the actual scientific papers, so I'm not quite sure whether they extended the, um, the dirty snowball um, uh, sort of uh, mechanism to their, their very, very deep water or not, I'm not sure. Uh, but there is a lot more water in the Earth than we can see because there's so much of it um, uh, so, sort of subcrustally uh, locked up in hydrated min hydrous minerals in the, in the upper mantle. And they're responsible for a lot of the, uh, the movement and the lubrication and the, the sort of deep earth properties that, uh, that we see, which many, many of which are due to water. Um, so um, there is a lot of water. We, I, I, it wasn't a surprise that there, was, there is water there, complexed in some way in minerals. Um, but um, yeah, there is, there, is, there is more water deep in the earth. I mean, there isn't actually very much water on the surface. If you, if you put it all together, it's all, it's all rather small and it's rather precious and we need to look after it. Um, by far the greatest amount of it is locked up in minerals somewhere in, in the crust or just underneath it. This um, 30,000 tons of meteorites that fall on the Earth, if it all came in one big cube, how big would the cube be? Oh, crikey. <laughs> it's like those awful O-level um, <laughs> physics questions. Uh, well, this weighs about 1.3 kilograms. <laughs> can one take a... Well, one take a density? Of yeah, I mean, uh, th th this is about, this is about, well, anyway, I'm going to mix my units. It's about six inches across, and it weighs about 1.3 kilograms. And the, <laughs> this is a replica, but this is a good replica, so therefore it does actually weigh the same as the, as the original um, meteorite. You're going to have to do the maths, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the density? Uh, uh, I, I have no idea offhand. Um, <laughs> I mean, the very, um, I suppose it's, a, ooh, I don't know, it feels like about five to me. I don't know. Specific gravity, I don't know, something like that. It's pretty dense. I mean, it's it's like a. Well, come on, feel it for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you get a for it. Uh, yeah, but I can't. I can't imagine thirty thousand tons. <laughs> Not as iron, but as 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 a fairly rich iron ore. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, time, I think, for one more. Uh, to follow on from your question, um, from the previous one, would, wouldn't it be too hot down there, about 50 or 150 kilometres down for water? Well, normally it would, yes, but it, the, thing, the, the thing is that pre um, under, under high pressure conditions, um, the behaviour of these things changes. I mean, for example, there's, there's, there's no molten rock down there, even though it's hot enough for it to be molten because of the pressure. So it, it's, it's to do with, in fact, most of the interesting things to do with the way in which the Earth works as a, as a, as a machine, uh, to do with understanding the way the different mineral phases work at very, very high pressures. Right, so my question was, um, earlier you had a, a large meteorite inside some steps. Um, oh, yes, yeah, so the, the, the Hober meteorite, picture. yes, that's right, yes. Um, was that where it landed? Uh, yes, that, 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 that picture actually, it, it gives the impression that it's in a crater. 
Um, but actually, that's just the hole that they dug it, yeah, that, that they dug to find it, because they, de they, they detected it on the surface and then dug down and found the mass. Um, so it was, it was buried by soil growth. So it was only buried by a metre or something? Oh, yes. I mean, it, it wasn't very deep. I mean, it, it's, so it's about two or three metres. How does a meteorite that size, quite large, mm. um, survive when it's travelling at that huge sort of 30,000 miles an hour or whatever? Uh, when it yeah, hits, well, how it, does it survive without the explosion being disintegrated? It depends when another on another meteorite can be destroyed just by the atmosphere yeah. in, in, you know, a kilometre up or whatever. Absolutely right. And what, you're, what, what you've pointed out is the, is the difference in composition between uh, different sorts of meteorites. The rocky meteorites, like, like, like this one, uh, which is an, L, an L2 chondrite, that's made of silicate material. Um, I mean, don't forget that, that um, uh, astero asteroids, when they break up, um, the, although these are too small now to be molten in the middle or anything like that, They've, they've, they cooled long ago, but they formed at a time when the, uh, where everything was very hot and there, there, there was a lot, of, a lot more radioactive elements around. Aluminium-26 is uh, now extinct, um, but then it wasn't. And so things, quite small things, got hot enough to become molten in the middle and then to differentiate. And so they formed nickel-iron cores and silicate mantles, just like the Earth on a bigger scale. Um, and, but then, because they were so small, um, having that ratio of surface to volume, um, they then cooled and went solid. And then they got smashed to bits, and so you ended up with bits of this fragmented asteroid, some of which came from the silicate uh, outer parts and some of which come from the core. So you can divide meteorites up into two sorts. You have the stony meteorites, which come from the, the mantle and the crust, if you like, of the, of the asteroid, and then you've got the nickel-iron ones, which come from the core. And the difference between them is that the nickel-iron ones are tough, and when they come in through the atmosphere, they don't break up. Uh, they may ablate um, as, as, as molten material gets washed off the front of them by the atmosphere, um, but they tend to land intact, so they tend to punch their way right through the atmosphere uh, at, 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 at that sort of size, so the sort of size that you saw the Hover meteorite, which um, is a few tens of thousands of years old, so it's a lot smaller than it was because it's corroded and got a bit smaller, but it's still the biggest mass. Now, that can come all the way through the atmosphere without exploding, whereas the, the um, uh, stony meteorites, like the one that exploded over Chelyabinsk, fortunately, you know, they, 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 can, they can often be very large, but fortunately the atmosphere is enough to destroy them because uh, what happens is that the, the enormous physical stresses of coming through the atmosphere and the thermal stresses too of being molten on the outside and absolutely almost, almost to absolute zero in the middle causes them to explode. And so they, they come through the atmosphere they, 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 they burn up, and then there reaches a point where the, the whole thing catastrophically explodes, and you have much smaller meteorites then distributed over a, over a large strewn field. Um, so the nickel-iron meteorites um, are, in a sense, uh, more, they're more penetrative. They're, I'm getting them more like bullets, really. So they come through like a bullet. Now, the, the, the one in the, the Hober meteorite, that, because this brings in the other aspect, Instead of, because it, it, there's no guarantee that something, when it drops to Earth, is got, especially when it's traveling at that speed and it doesn't lose its cosmic velocity, there's no necessity for it to be dropping almost vertically. Uh, it could be coming in at almost any angle. And there are some meteorites, uh, craters, which um, record several sort of Barnes-Wallace-type um, bouncing mo motions. Um, and the one, in, it's thought, anyway, that the... Uh, where you get a meteorite, you don't necessarily get a crater, um, and it depends on it depends on the um, on the substrate that it lands on and the angle at which it comes in. And it's thought that the that the Hober meteorite uh, probably did have a little bit of a crater to begin with, but it's been there for fifty thousand years. Uh, whatever crater it, it, it came in at a, at a glancing blow, it didn't create very much of a crater. The crater was eroded away, and then soil growth covered it up again. So that, that, and it only appears now to be in a crater because they had to dig away the soil in order to expose it. Can I ask how, how much of the... Yeah, I think that, unfortunately, we've gone slightly over time. Ah, yeah, but I'd sorry. like to uh, thank the speaker again for, for the talk.